But even if you did try to find that exact middle lane that would somehow make everybody happy, it wouldn't make anybody happy because, again, you wouldn't be going far enough in a direction that everybody wants. So part of it is just an argument for always being true to yourself and true to what you believe. Um, but I spend a lot of time on this in the book, too, the compromises you have to make with yourself when you work in politics and in a democracy. You can't just go up to the roof of the White House and shout whatever you want. And all of us as speechwriters were young progressives who had fervently passionate beliefs in what's right and what's wrong. But you also need to win in order to get your ideas through. You know, you can be a purist and keep losing elections and accomplish nothing. Or you can make some compromises with yourself where it's like, all right, I'll take 80% of what I want, or maybe even 60% of what I want, maybe even 51% of what I want, but it's better than zero. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. I will live every day as if there were a microphone tucked under my tongue. It's great to get in the game, but don't get in the game until you understand the rules till you're an insider. Your life changes when you begin having a different conversation in your head. What we need to do in radically deep problems is propose radically visionary solutions. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Greetings, everyone. My name is Julie Masters, and you are listening to another episode of Inside Influence, in which I delve into the minds of some of the world's most fascinating influencers or experts in influence to get to the bottom of what it really takes to own your voice and then amplify it to drive an industry, a conversation, a movement, or a nation. Now, here's today's question. If you had to pick the most pivotal 10 days of your career, what would they be? 10 days that either looking back or in the moment felt like everything had been leading you here. A series of sliding doors events that had the power to shift everything you've been working towards and everything that would come next. Now, perhaps it was a landmark decision that could have gone either way. A moment in the spotlight to either make an impact or publicly fall short or a crisis you could just have never have foreseen. Now, these are usually the moments that decide who we become as leaders, communicators, and influencers. Now, a few years ago, I had the genuine pleasure of interviewing someone whose work and career I had been a massive fan of for a very long time. That person is Cody Keenan, chief speechwriter for President Obama. Now, as a part of that original conversation, we talked about the structure of a powerful speech, why the first question he asks President Obama in preparation for any speech is always, why is this a story that only you can tell? And what it really takes to forget the critics and show up as a fearless communicator. Now, if you haven't already, check it out. It goes down as one of my all-time favorite episodes. But at the end of that conversation, Cody mentioned that he was writing a book, working on a book about his experiences in the White House. I said, let me know when you're ready to talk about it. And two years later, and one pandemic later, his new book, Grace, 10 Days in the Battle for America, arrived hot off the press on my doorstep. Grace covers 10 days of Cody's career in June of 2015, when Obama and Cody composed a series of speeches to meet a succession of stunning developments in American history, including a white supremacist shooting, and an astonishing act of forgiveness. A national reckoning with race and the Confederate flag, the fate of marriage equality, and a vital decision on the Affordable Care Act. In this, which is our second conversation, we obviously talk about the book, which at that stage had just been published and had already hit the top of the New York Times bestseller list. But also we talk about his hopes and fears for the next generation of communicators. We also cover behind the scenes over those 10 pivotal days, including his ever-present fear that his words as a speechwriter wouldn't be enough. Obama's reluctance to deliver the eulogy at the memorial of the Charlestown shooting victims, including why he originally felt like he had no more words left to say, and the moment that eventually changed his mind. The unprecedented tightrope that Obama and Cody walked as the first black presidency, knowing that one wrong word and one off-the-cuff moment had the power to undo every single word that had come before. Why the silences between the words in any speech matter just as much 
as the words themselves. And finally, the difference between taking a half swing and a full swing as a communicator. This is one of my favorite moments from this conversation. Basically, the difference between making the impact we're capable of making versus holding back in fear of the critics. A loving warning, this conversation discusses both the act and details of mass shootings on American soil. As you'll hear, this conversation also heartbreakingly took place just days after the Colorado spring shooting on November 19th, 2022. A fact that was very much on everybody's heart during this recording. Please do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself and any ears that may be listening. For me, speaking with Cody, it just, it always reminds me how hard it is to create change. The courage that it takes to step up and put your work, your words, your career, your reputation and your heart on the line every single day without any guarantee of success. And also how we can learn to walk that line, that line between hope the conviction that we can build a new future together and the inevitable frustration, that fire in your belly that keeps you in the arena or sat at your desk writing a eulogy long after the crowds have gone home. There is no perfect way to hit that ball, right? All you can do is pretty much just try and take a full swing. On that note, sit back, enough from me. Be kind, stay brave, and enjoy a glimpse into a world of influence that we rarely get to experience via the incredible Cody Keenan. Welcome back to the podcast, Cody Keenan. That's so good to have you back. Hi, Julie. It's nice to see you again. So much has happened since I saw you last. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's really hard to kind of put into words everything that has gone on. I mean, the least, the least, well, not the least, but probably the biggest in your world is you've you've had a baby girl, you've you've written a New York Times bestselling book. There's been obviously a pandemic, and I feel I feel a bit lazy in comparison to all the things that you've done since I spoke to you last. Well, I know you have a three year old, so you're not entirely lazy and off the hook here. No, no, there you know, I definitely have my moments of um of juggling, but that's yeah, that's a big couple of years for you. Yeah, we were we were we were very busy. Uh and I also I have a speech writing company and I teach. So, there's a lot going on. Well, we're going to get into the book today. I wanted to talk to you. I wanted to talk to you about the book. I, it was just it's such an incredible. Not only is it an incredible glimpse into, you know, what was a pivotal moment in time in the Obama presidency and in your career and for the both of you as a team. But it's also just a breathtakingly beautiful piece of work. And, you know, I say that honestly, like it's, we were just saying before, before we jumped on air that usually I have this way that I've developed of speed reading books to kind of pick out, just looking for pattern recognition, essentially to pick out kind of key themes. And, but As I said, my husband came out three hours later. I sat on the floor in our lounge room and he came out and he's like, what are you doing? Why are you talking to yourself for three hours? (laughs) (laughs) I said, I'm only halfway through this book and I can't put it down. And, you know, I I just, I'm going to need to read all of it. I've just decided I'm going to need to read all of it. And it was just the, the incredible use of language, which shouldn't be a surprise, but it was still, it was still breathtaking. Um, so before we kick into those 10 days, um, I wanted to just quickly ask, which is, you know, a question that I start every episode with now, which is what's one idea that's just having a huge amount of impact on your, on your thinking right now, that's really influencing the way you think about things. You know, over the, there's, there's been so much going on between this book tour and teaching and my day job and the baby. But one thing that's kind of broken through in the last couple of weeks with the, the downfall of the self-professed genius billionaire class between um, Donald Trump kind of losing his party the midterms here in the United States, between Elon Musk um, wrecking Twitter and basically running it based on his own um, childish whims, and uh, the crypto guy with FTX kind of completely falling apart uh, in in what should have been a pretty obvious way, um, or obvious to see, is that Nobody knows anything. 
that's really kind of the thing influencing my thinking. And that's, I mean, that's something I've been thinking throughout a lot of the pandemic too. Uh, and President Obama and I wrote a couple of commencement addresses early in the pandemic for graduating students who had to do it, you know, via Zoom. Um, and the thought is basically that nobody knows anything. You know, we, I still feel really young, but I'm 42. Like this is the age where we're supposed to be in charge, right? And you recognize that as you grow up, nobody really knows anything. You know, when you're when you're younger, you just assume that that grown ups know what they're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, I never put any any faith in those three people that I mentioned earlier, but but it shows it pretty vividly and clearly. Um, and I, the corollary to that and I, I listened to the podcast. so I know the next question you ask is uh, if I was on stage and could say something to everybody, the corollary to nobody knows anything is that all of us have agency. And all of us need to use it. You know, there is nobody coming along to save us here. Um, I've been thinking over the last two days about, you know, yet another mass shooting here in the United States in a uh, LGBTQ nightclub in Colorado Springs. And <clears throat> this was something that was entirely predictable. You know, it's, it's still shocking and terrible, but it's not a surprise um, when you have an entire right wing apparatus that... Uh, is kind of more flagrant now about demonizing LGBTQ people. Um, you know, you see it on on right wing cable news every night. They will just make up these stories about gay people, uh, you know, sexualizing children. So it's only a matter of time before somebody with access to a gun is going to go act out on this stuff because he's just fed it every single night. Um, that's a rough way to start out the show, but. But my point is, when all of us have agency, you know, everybody really needs to stand up and not just speak out about this stuff, but actually put a stop to it. You know, elect elect people who don't engage in this stuff. I mean, we have we have sitting members of Congress who engage in this stuff. Um, elect people who will pass tougher gun laws. Um, you know, everybody always holds holds up Australia as an example of a place where it worked. You know, um, so. That's a tough way to start the show. The, 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 the brighter spot in it is you know, I, I teach students now at Northwestern University. I teach them about speech writing. And um, so many of them have come to talk to me this year about how I've, I've never thought about actually going into politics before and actually being a speech writer. Now I want to do it. How do I do it? And they're just so impatient to change the world in ways I didn't have to be when I was sitting in literally the exact same classroom 20 years ago. You look at the speeches they're writing when I let them choose the topic and half the class every week writes about climate change and gun control, which is not the type of thing that I had to write about when I was 20 years old. So they, they have grown up uh, in a much different world, and yet they are still very eager and impatient to take that stage in your question um, and, uh, and tell everybody to uh, use their agency. You know, like we don't have to believe in, in nonsense anymore. You know, every single one of us has power. You know, the I really felt when you, you said no one knows anything, you know, because the first the first way to take that right is, you know, we're screwed. You know, no one knows anything. But the truth of it is that, as you said, it means that everybody has a voice, that everybody has agency. And I remember when I first I started my first business in my early 20s and it was managing people who had started founders of banks because it was a speaker management agency and so anybody who was hitting the stage speaking about their experiences and it was authors and police commissioners and CEOs and just incredible people and I remember going into those meetings in my early 20s thinking you know these guys must these guys these are the guys that have all the answers right like these are the guys who who know these are the guys who literally you know have written books on this and and you find out very quickly that it isn't that they have this guidebook that nobody else has it isn't like they have this access to higher knowledge that nobody else has it's just that they show up they are willing to show up at a different level consistently and offer what they have not that what they have is everything but they are willing to show up and offer what they have and that's the single I think biggest decision when it comes to making an impact how much and how frequently are you willing to show up with what you've got I totally agree with that. I, I tell my students to, to dive in, get into politics right away. Don't waste time. Don't don't worry about whether or not a campaign is going to lose. That's not why you should you should join in the first place. And run. I mean, I think uh, 
a lot of people on this tour ask me, you know, what's the Obama's legacy? Uh, and they expect me to answer with some um, policy initiative or another. But it's actually the fact that uh, Michelle Obama, as usual, put it best. She, she during their portrait unveiling at the White House a couple months ago, she said, look, someone like me was never supposed to be here. And that always makes me think about who decides what, what the words supposed to means. And um, the legacy, I think, that will manifest itself, and it's already starting, it's just going to take time, is you've got, in every successive election here in the United States, you've got more and more people running for office who, quote unquote, aren't supposed to be running for office. Um, people who are younger, browner, gayer, who actually, you know, grew up um, without the traditional trappings and spoils of power and elite education. And I think that's actually going to make this a better place when uh, our, our legislative um, houses all over the country are more representative of the country. Um, and yeah, it's going to take a little bit of time, but I'm, but I'm really hopeful that, uh, you know, by the end of the decade, we'll be showing a different face to the world. Mm. Before we get into the, the 10 days, I just wanted to talk about a line that was at the very beginning of your book, and it's about walking into the Oval Office. And you said, the gravitas of it squeezes the air from your lungs like pressure at the seafloor, which other than just being a beautiful piece of writing made me wonder, you know, does that, does that pressure every time you walk into that office of what it represents, the symbol that it is, how it reminds you of what you are there to do and the time that you have to do it in? Um, does it lessen over time or does it stay the same? You get used, you get used to it like anything else. I, you know, the first few times you are aware of all the history swirling around you and you, you have to, I remember being in a, a meeting. I mean, we took office right at the worst of the financial crisis in 2009. You still had 800,000 Americans losing their jobs every single month. And I remember catching myself in an economic meeting in the Oval Office, um, I hadn't been paying attention for, you know, I don't know, probably less than 30 seconds because I was just looking around the Oval Office, you know, feeling like a tourist. And then you're quickly like, no, 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 you're here now. This is your job. You, you have you have to listen and pay attention and you know, start taking notes. Um, that eventually goes away like anything else. You know, I, you, you start feeling comfortable in the Oval Office. You start feeling comfortable around him. I never truly felt comfortable with being a speechwriter. It just, it just always kept me on my toes. And I always wanted to deliver... Um, the best piece of writing I could to him. And that, I, I just stopped working for President Obama last year. Uh, and that never truly went away. You also mentioned, which fascinated me, that how he used the room to its fullest advantage. Um, you said, you know, it was two degrees too hot, the chairs were at awkward angles and, and two inches too low. That had just never occurred to me. That I would assume that it was set up, you know, to be conducive to to meetings, to be conducive to flow of communication. But it seems like it was set up quite the opposite. Why? Why was that? I never asked him if it was intentional. It was definitely more than two degrees too hot. Um, it was, you know, God, it was probably close to eighty Fahrenheit. I don't know how that translates, but um, you know, he's somebody who grew up spend, spending most of his life between the twenty second parallels. He is. He likes it hot. He would keep Air Force One a little too warm up up in the nose where his office was. Um, so that's that's one way he pressed that advantage. The other is the the couches he chose were too deep, too plush. There's really no way to sit on them comfortably. You either you either end up slouching um, way back like you're watching a movie, or sitting up straight like you're the nerdy kid in school who's got all the answers. I I realized, <clears throat> excuse me, um, fairly quickly on that if I got in there first. I could steal two pillows and put them behind me, and that way I could actually sit normally and comfortably while everyone else uh, was kind of squirming and uncomfortable. All right, I want to let's go to I want to go to day one. Um, now the book is called Grace: Ten Days in the Battle for America. Why, why those ten days? Why did you choose those ten days? You could have written about anything, any period of time. Yeah, well, first and foremost, I didn't want to write a memoir. Like I said, I still feel young. I felt like that would be a little self-serving, um, just to write by myself. And as a speechwriter, we're not supposed to be seen or heard. You know, that's that's obviously impossible in this day and age. We had a press corps uh, in the White House, 20 feet from my office, that knew who we were and what we were doing. Um, but I chose those 10 days because, first of all, the, the sheer magnitude of the events that happened in just 10 days. Um, I remember somebody writing 
right after they they all happened that it was it was too implausible for an entire season of the TV show The West Wing. And when I was telling friends I was writing this book, um, they all remembered all the events and they said I had no I I could not tell you that those all happened in the same week and a half stretch. Um, you might hear a siren in the background. It's because I live in New York City. Um, but, you know, we as the 10 days opened, we were already preparing for, and by we, I mean my speech writing team, um, the Supreme Court was going to rule on, on 14 cases, but two of particular importance to us and to the country. One was on Obama's signature domestic legislation, uh, the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare. And I know this always sounds strange to countries that actually have universal health care, but we, it was, it was probably the single biggest thing. Well, it was the single biggest thing any president had done to close the gap of the uninsured in America since um, President Johnson in the 60s when he created Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, and Republicans did were doing everything they could to try to dismantle it, take it down, take it through the courts. Um, but there's a very real chance that if we lost that week, millions of Americans who work you know, two jobs and uh, were still you know, solidly middle class or, or even below middle class, but made more, made too much money to qualify for our low income insurance like Medicaid. Um, there's a very real chance that millions of Americans were going to lose that health insurance. And with the Supreme Court looking at marriage equality, there's a very real chance that if they said no, millions of Americans would be told, you're second class citizens. You don't get to get married like the rest of us do. So we were already kind of heightened preparing for all that. And then this massacre happens in Charleston, South Carolina, where a, uh, a uh, self-radicalized white supremacist went into a black church, um, into a prayer group, and murdered eight parishioners and their pastor and said uh, that he wanted to start a race war. I mean, it was intentional. Um, and that kind of changes everything right away. I mean, all, mass shootings always kind of put the White House on high alert, but one that really gets at race and some of our darkest demons. Um, we were We were preparing for things to go south in a big way. Um, you know, that's the type of thing that there could be recrimination. It, it really tears at our deepest divisions. Um, then something extraordinary happened two days after that. The the families of the victims all went to the killer's arraignment in court and one by one forgave him. Um, you know, they were crying. They were Some of them were wailing. They, this person had just taken away their parents, their kids, their friends, their pastor. Uh, and one by one, they forgave him. And that was just an extraordinary act of grace, hence hence the title of the book. But it sort of changed the way we all walked that week. Um, you saw the, the, the debate around all of it was a little more mature than usual. Um, Republican governors in, in the South uh, started quietly lowering the Confederate flag over public spaces. You know, as absurd as it was, it was still flying there in 2015. Um, something like this helped bring it down. Um, we won those Supreme Court cases and, you know, but there was, there was a real debate in the White House as to whether or not Obama was going to give a eulogy after that mass shooting as he had done after so many others. Uh, he didn't want to, and I didn't want to write one. Um, we had done it way too many times and we had a pretty passionate debate in the White House with a few other staffers as in the Oval Office with a few other staffers as to whether we should do it. And the president, you know, said, I've, we've run out of words. He asked me, you know, do you have any, do you have anything left to say here? And I told him no, because um, we've just done it so many times. But that's not ever really true. You can find inspiration anywhere, um, and it, it was what those families did ultimately that that convinced President Obama to go and to build that eulogy around grace. And so uh, that was on the sixth day of the week where he decided um, he was going to do it. I started writing it on the on the seventh day. The Supreme Court ruled for Obamacare on day eight or day nine, uh, ruled for marriage equality on day 10. And on that same day, um, after the president spoke in the Rose Garden, and he was he was visibly moved by the fact that the country had come so far so fast, relatively speaking, on, a, on an equal rights issue like that. Uh, we boarded the helicopter to fly to Andrews Air Force Base uh, and then flew down to Charleston where he delivered a eulogy, sang Amazing Grace, and we came home that night to a White House lit up in all the colors of the rainbow. And that's, that's a very long answer to your question. Um, but it wasn't just the magnitude of the events. It was what they meant, each of them, as to, you know, it, it, every single one of them went directly at who are we as a country, as Americans? Do, do we actually believe that all of us are created equal? And what are we willing to do to make sure that's true? Are we willing to stand up to white supremacists and bigots uh, and misogynists? Are we willing to make sure that, you know, people who are 
we all know the term essential workers now. Are we willing to make sure that they have health insurance? Are we willing to make sure that our gay brothers and sisters can get married and have equal rights just like the rest of us? Um, and the answer to all those questions in that week was a resounding yes. Um, and then we went through four years of the opposite with, with a total opposite type of person at the White House. And that's, that's actually more than anything else what inspired me to write the book. And it also speaks, just listening to you there, I mean, that's firstly for 10 days, that's a lot of pivotal moments. But it also speaks to the agency that you were discussing before that we were talking about, which is, as you said, the families of the, the Charleston victims, they set the tone for that conversation. You know, usually we assume that the politicians set the tone and we go from there, but actually it was the actions of those families that set the tone for that entire time. Um, I just want to, I want to go back to that day for a second. So it's the June 17th, um, the massacre, massacre happens. In the book, you had said that in 2015 alone, there were 372 mass shootings in America. Now I had to read that line. It's very trite and cliche to say that it's unbelievable, but I, I genuinely had to read that line two or three times just to make sure that I'd got those numbers right in my head. And you said it was the 14th time President Obama had addressed the nation after a mass shooting, the 14th time I'd have to find a new way for him to offer some reassurance that the world will keep spinning even when it's full of holes. This, it, it got me thinking what, about you in that moment. You know, there would be so many competing emotions, right? Like you, there would be heartbreak, there would be anger, shock. Where do, what's your first instinct as a writer? in that moment? Was it to say, I have nothing more to say? Or was it to, you know, want to write down all the reasons that this should not have happened? Where did you go to first? You know, it, it's just not true that we that we didn't have anything left to say. We knew we did. We just didn't want to have to do it again. Um, the, the, the first place my brain goes is usually, you know, you, I'll snap into speech writing mode. Um, first, you have to have all the facts. You have to know, you know, is this really happening? Why is it happening? What were the motives? Um, then you have to figure out who we've lost, um, what the importance of it is. And, but a lot of it is, you, you kind of hinted at this, it's, it would usually be, my first response would usually be anger that we're still doing this, that we're still going through this. Um, but as a speechwriter, I couldn't let cynicism or fatalism seep in, even though by 2015, there were plenty of times where, when it felt like speeches were just inadequate. Um, and, you know, a speech on its own doesn't change things. You know, it, I don't think it ever has. Um, someone actually asked me that in an interview a couple of weeks ago. You know, you gave all these speeches after mass shootings and there are still mass shootings. Have you failed? Well, who told you a speech is fixes everything? We have agency again, which is now becoming the theme of this podcast. You know, it's up, it's it's on us to to vote the right way, to vote people out if they're standing in the way. Um, and you know, we shouldn't be cynical about it. There 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 has been a lot of progress, however small and fleeting, on the state levels. Um, you know, President Biden signed into law the most important gun bill in thirty years, even though I don't think anybody thinks it goes far enough, him him included. Um, we we tried to go back in time a little bit. We tried in 2013, um, and this goes directly into why Obama didn't want to give a eulogy. We're coming up now on the 10th anniversary in a couple of weeks of a mass shooting in Newtown, Connecticut, where 20 little kids were murdered in their school, six-year-olds, uh, along with six teachers who who died trying to protect them. And uh, President Obama had just won re-election a few weeks before. We were already working on his second inaugural address, and he said us we'd write a eulogy for that too. Um, and he had to, he set aside his second term agenda to try to do something about guns, which we knew the odds of that were long, um, you know, partially because of America's culture, but also because Republicans had a filibuster proof majority in the Senate, which meant you don't just get to pass things with 50 votes. You need 60. Um, it's antiquated. It, it has its roots in racism and segregation. It's 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 not constitutional. It's a, a rule that the Senate can get rid of at any time. Um, but. One glimmer of hope was there were two conservative senators, one Republican, one Democrat, who got together. They had A ratings from the National Rifle Association, and they wrote a bill that would make universal background checks the law. 90% of Americans supported that bill. 80% of Republicans supported that bill. 70% of uh, households that were members of the National Rifle Association, which is the basically the gun manufacturer's lobby that makes change so difficult, supported that bill. 
So uh, we spent a couple months campaigning for it, and then it ultimately came up for a vote in the Senate, and Republicans blocked it uh, with the parents of the, the children who were murdered in their school looking on. And that was about as cynical as I've ever seen President Obama get, and angry. Um, he, he went out and gave a pretty passionate statement in the Rose Garden of the White House and came back inside and said, look, what do we do the next time this happens? I don't want to just give another eulogy. You know, that, that there's this cycle where um, Republicans retreat into their corners and say it's not our fault. The NRA goes silent for a few days. I have to go out and give a eulogy and, and it gives the country permission to move on. And there's new moving on from this. I don't want to move on from this. We should be politicizing this every single time until change happens. So that's that's where that's where the genesis of him not wanting to give a eulogy in Charleston came from. Um, ultimately, the families inspired him to do it. But there there were plenty of times where writing a speech just didn't feel adequate to the moment because it's not. It's just we wrote a bunch of, of beautiful speeches on gun reform and eulogizing victims and doing real and honest outreach to the other side and then it just falls apart because there are some parts of washington um, that had a vested interest in keeping guns flowing out onto the streets and so until that changes um very little is going to change you took a lot in in the book about the tightrope the tightrope that you had to walk obama needed to walk um in many different ways, and you've just talked about there, you know, the tightrope between competing parties and the tightrope between what you want to say and what you, you need to say or what you have to say or what works, the words that work, the tightrope between emotion and how you feel and how you can allow what you feel to come out through the words. But the particular, the particular tightrope that really struck me was the one that Obama needed to walk and you needed to walk as a member of his team as the first black president. And the impact that one word can have on that conversation, on that national conversation. And you told this incredible story about Henry Louis Gates and, and his arrest. Can you just talk to, talk to that story? Because I think it really highlights how one word can change everything and the pressure that's on these statements. Yeah, you know, it was pretty obvious to everybody that Barack Obama was the first black president in a country that uh, still has a long history of, of racism and, and structural racism um, that we're, you know, in some ways just just barely just getting out of. And uh, But he never ran as a black president. He, he ran as a president who... Um, the way I always describe it is he 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 practiced a kind of politics that was redemptive. Um, he didn't practice a politics of repudiation. He didn't get up there and scold voters or you know point at the sins of our past as as reasons for why we're inherently um, flawed. Instead, he did something different. He gave people the permission structure to change and to come along. Um, you know, he one of my favorite lines he ever inserted into a speech was that you know what what a remarkable thing it would be for the South to rise again, not by reasserting the past but by transcending it. And you know that kind of politics actually worked, especially for for someone who would be the first black president. It's how he ended up the first president who won fifty one percent of the vote twice since Eisenhower. He won over uh, white working class voters across the industrial Midwest, which is where Democrats have struggled since. He won states like Indiana, North Carolina for the first time in 44 years because of that kind of politics. When you get to the White House, you, you still have to practice that. And, but you also have, um, as the first black president, you're going to have different audiences that want to hear very different things from you. And just one misstep in either direction might set off one of those audiences. Um, you don't have a big margin for error. And so in, in 2009, I believe it was, uh, pretty early in the administration, there was a news story that didn't get a ton of traction for a few days until a reporter asked Obama about it at a White House uh, press briefing. And what had happened was there was a, a famous um, professor at Harvard University named Henry Louis Gates, who um, a black professor, taught black studies, and he locked himself out of his house and he was trying to get back into his house. And somebody called the cops on him, um, which is something that immediately sort of that strikes a nerve for a lot of black Americans. Um, and so they arrested him at his own house. They just didn't believe it was his. And, and uh, you know, he, he talked back, apparently, and the police didn't like it. So President Obama answered the question by saying, look, I think the police acted stupidly. Uh, and that was it. That one word, stupidly, ended up becoming a massive story in the right-wing press uh, for over a week. 
until Obama had to apologize and have the police officer over to the White House for a beer. But the damage was kind of done. His support among white voters fell below 50% and never, ever recovered because of that one word, that one instance. Um, and that wasn't something that muzzled him going forward, but it did convince him that, you know, I, fine, I do have to be more careful and measured with my words. And this is something that, this is somebody who is generally careful and measured with his words. That's why we write speeches. You know, we go through drafts and edit them until they're exactly what you want to say. Um, but uh, it, it was a powerful example of the tightrope he had to walk. Mm. And not only that, but you said that the support amongst white supporters plummeted, but black supporters were also disappointed that he had apologized at all, that he yeah. should have to apologize. Yeah, you, you couldn't make anybody happy. There, there was, <clears throat> it was very, even if you did try to find that exact middle lane that would somehow make everybody happy, it wouldn't make anybody happy because, it, you again, you wouldn't be going far enough in a direction that everybody wants. So part of it is just an argument for always being true to yourself and true to what you believe. Um, but I spent a lot of time on this in the book too, the compromises you have to make with yourself when you work in politics and in a democracy. You can't just go up to the roof of the White House and shout whatever you want. And, you know, all of us as speechwriters were young progressives who – had fervently passionate beliefs in what's right and what's wrong. Um, but you also need to win in order to get your ideas through. You know, you can be a purist um, and keep losing elections and accomplish nothing. Or you can make some compromises with yourself where it's like, all right, I'll take 80% of what I want, or maybe even 60% of what I want, maybe even 51% of what I want, but it's better than zero. Mm. There's beautiful language um, that I you know, you mentioned Obama used with you when it comes to writing speeches, and that was the difference between taking a half swing and a full swing at a speech. And, you know, I was thinking about that and I was thinking, you know, that fear that we've just talked about, that, you know, that tightrope could fall either way, one word could blow the whole thing up. It's very easy to then take a half swing at something, right? Like to, to wrap yourself in the fear of it and take a half swing. How did you both Talk about that amongst yourselves, the difference between taking a half swing almost out of fear and then taking a full swing. Yeah, totally. That was I was I was drafting um, his speech in Selma, Alabama, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the marches from Selma to the state capital of Montgomery. Um, and this was it was something John Lewis led these marches as a younger man. And they were basically it was just a bunch of a bunch of poor young black people who were marching for not special rights, but equal rights, the right to vote. You know, they had it, but they were being denied it every single day um, by, you know, just arbitrary rules saying uh, you can only register to vote if you can count the number of jelly beans in this jar or bubbles on a bar of soap. I mean, it sounds preposterous, but those were the hurdles that black voters had to jump in the South. Um, so they were just marching for that and they barely made it out of out of the bridge, out of the out of town over this bridge. And the state police were waiting for them and whipped out their nightsticks and tear gas and just beat black Americans just for uh, marching for their equal rights. And, um, you know, that was something that that sort of the photos from that rocketed around the world and shook the conscience of the country. And ultimately, President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act into law later that year. Um, so we, we were going down to president was going to speak there. And there's there's this, you know, it, it, there's an amazing symbolism with the first black president going to commemorate what they did there 50 years later. Um, but I, you know, I, I, in my in my uh, kind of zeal to rise to the moment and get him something perfect, to get a, the, a perfect draft to the president, I wrote something that was too safe. You know, it was beautiful. Um, some of the lines were great, but it wasn't really all that edgy or interesting. It was kind of not not quite sterile, but but uh, it was something that somebody else could give. A different politician could have given. Um, not so much President Obama. And so I, we benefited from having a snow day two days before the speech, which, uh, if that sounds insane to an Australian, in, in Washington, um, just a couple of inches of snow can paralyze the city. So uh, we had the day off. All of his meetings were pulled down because nobody came to work. I went to work because I knew that I could get President Obama for several hours. And so that's when he, he read that first draft and said, uh, you took a half swing on this, to use a baseball metaphor. Take a full swing. Um, and that, that actually kind of empowered me to go back to my desk and write something bigger. You know, I might have been afraid that, that giving him something bigger right out of the gate wasn't right. 
Um, but that was very liberating to have him say that. It meant that I could go play with, with some more interesting ideas. Mm. And the permission of a full swing, somebody to give you permission, you know, go take a full swing, like yeah. give it everything, yeah. give it everything you've got here. Um, want to fast forward day six, you know, it's trending now that he will speak at the eulogy. What changed his mind? You mentioned that the, you know, the actions of the family were pivotal in changing his mind. Was there anything else that moved him more towards, okay, yep, I, I feel like I have more to say here. I feel like there's something else that I can contribute. Yeah, the, the sixth day of the book was a Monday, and I had spent that entire weekend um, kind of relieved because over the weekend I had heard that he decided he wasn't going. He just didn't want to go at all. So I just kind of breathed a sigh of relief that I wasn't going to have to panic and freak out of my desk over a high stakes eulogy for three days. Um, <clears throat> we had, like I said, we had a pretty heated debate in the Oval Office that Monday. Valerie Jarrett, his, his top advisor, was pushing him really hard to go. You know, and her argument was that people will expect you to go. They're going to expect you to come speak. And I pushed back saying that's not a good, it's not really a good reason. You know, you have to have something to say. You don't just go because people want you to go. Um, and at first, President Obama was on my side. He said, you know, we have, we have nothing left to say. He, he's, I write in the book that it was the first time he used me as a, as a uh, human shield instead of a punching bag. I mean, he, he pointed at me. He was like, Cody, you got anything to say? You got any words left? And I said, no, sir, I do not. Uh, and it was Josh Ernest, the press secretary, who's, who's a man of deep faith, even if he'd never worn on his sleeve. He said, look, Mr. President, if you, if you are thinking about going, I think you could talk about what those families did. Um, three days ago. It's pretty powerful, the concept of grace. And you kind of see the president's shoulders fall a bit and, and his posture soften a bit. You know, he sort of let down his guard and, and started talking about a grace and a power, what a powerful concept it is and, and talking about the black church in America and, and what it meant to him. Um, he also went on a little rant about the Confederate flag and what that meant to him. And you could tell by the end of that he had changed his mind. You know, I, I think his exact words were, look, I... I I've come around to the fact that I need to go. I want to hug those families, but um, I still don't want to speak. But if I do speak, you know, and as soon as he says that, you can tell it's over. He said, if I do speak, that's what I want to talk about, grace. I want, to, I want he said, Cody, go, uh, go, go pour a drink and let her rip, write about guns, write about race, write about the Confederate flag and the pain it still stirs in too many of our citizens and wrap it all up in grace. And I just kind of stared at him and was like, I have no idea what that means, but I will go give it a shot. Grace went on to be the, the theme of the speech, the eulogy. It, you know, it's the, the title of the book. I also know that it's the name of your, of your daughter. And so that one conversation, you know, you just look at the ripple effects of this one moment in time and how it touched your life in so many ways. Um, I was struck by a conversation that you had with your wife at this point, you know, you said that you left that office just thinking, okay, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll go pour myself a drink and see if I see what I can do here. And you said, I don't even know if it is possible for the first black president to calm rather than flame this tension. And even if it is, I don't think I can write something that gets him there. That came hand in hand in the book, which I thought was an incredible moment of very of openness from you, where you talked about that you constantly felt like a fraud you know, that feeling of never being, of being a fraud never really went away. How did you learn to, to deal with that? Because that feeling can be paralyzing, right? Like that's, that imposter syndrome can stop you ever going to the level at which you're capable of, which we know that you did. How did you move through it? How do you move through it? I still don't know that I ever have. Um, you know, I, as someone who rarely like, I mean, I think it's also just intrinsic to being a writer in general, but it, as, as somebody who um, never likes anything I write. I do love this book. I'm very proud of this book. I feel like I finally got something right. Um, so maybe I've maybe I've gotten over it. But but at least but I had a, I had a year to write this book. With speeches, you had a couple days, tops. Um, and what made it worse was the person I was writing for because he is uh, a staggeringly gifted writer, um, and he knows it. He's on record saying I'm a better speechwriter than my speechwriters. And so he, he always viewed speechwriting as a collaborative endeavor. What he, what he wanted from us, and he would tell us this, is just give me something I can work with. You know, he had no problem taking that draft. And he, he, his favorite hours were usually between midnight and 2 a.m. And he'd be alone in the residence and he'd get out a pen and work on speeches. Um, we never heeded that advice because we wanted to get him something great. 
You know, we wanted to get him something perfect. We wanted him to email us and say, this is perfect. I have no edits. Even though Did that, that ever almost, happen? A couple times. A couple times. Not too many. Um, but a couple. There's, uh, I've, I've told this, this story uh, pretty rarely, but I, I told it on the late show with Stephen Colbert here in the States because he asked about it. Um, there, there was one example. Uh, the president was, was slated to give a speech on the 70th anniversary of D-Day. And again, that's not a speech you can screw up. You know, it, the, just the story of D-Day, D-Day is, is extraordinary. But I was still determined to make it the best speech any American president has ever given on the anniversary of D-Day. I mean, I was wrestling with history here. Um, <clears throat> and so he, he, I gave it to him on the flight to Paris and he came back on the plane and he actually said, this is great. I have no edits. And suddenly that freed up the possibility of something I hadn't considered, which was a night out in Paris um, with my colleagues, which we just, we never got to enjoy each other's company all that often. But so I, I cajoled a few speechwriters and staffers to let's go have dinner. And that turned into an all nighter in Paris. We got back to the hotel uh, around 7 a.m. right before the motorcade was scheduled to depart. And somebody dimed us out to the president. He busted us on the plane for going out all night in Paris. It would have freed up another possibility for you, right? Like it, the the possibility that it was possible that you could write a draft that he wouldn't touch. I mean, there's one thing to go, you know what? I'm going to give it my best and he'll always have edits and that's just fine. But now there's this possibility here that you can write something that he will deem to be perfect. Like that's got to mess with your head in a way. I always knew it was possible, but you still have to get there. Um, and that's that's why we would pull all-nighters. I mean, I one of my favorite passages in the book is describing an all-nighter in the West Wing and how strange a place the West Wing is after midnight. Um, there were plenty of times I slept on the, the love seat in my office. Uh, I didn't have a full couch because it wouldn't fit through the door. But... Um, it, it, it's a real challenge, and, and this eulogy was a particular challenge, and uh, this gets back to the tightrope he had to walk, because he was going to eulogize a black pastor who was murdered by a white supremacist. I mean, um, and, and, and as a black president, you know, it, there are people out there who, um, he was no stranger to death threats, obviously, but, but to go eulogize someone who didn't have the protection he did from, from somebody who's steeped in that kind of thinking, knowing that there is a chunk of the country that is steeped in that kind of thinking. Um, that just that was one of the things that made that so difficult for me to write. Uh, as a white man, I always struggled with, with speeches for him about race. Not because I couldn't do it. Um, to be a speechwriter demands that you have a sense of empathy. It demands that you can write for anybody, male or female, whatever race, whatever, whatever orientation, um, whatever belief system. But uh, it's, it's still difficult. Empathy only goes so far. You know, to be a black man in America still to this day is something that I will never understand. Um, you know, fortunately, we had him to, if I was stuck, I'd go talk to him about it and just be like, tell me more about this. Uh, tell me more about the story you want to tell, how it makes you feel. Um, you know, I just don't have that lived experience he does. So, because uh, he has lived, you know, he's the president of the United States, sure, but he was also a black man for, for 40 something years before that. Um, so he, he has plenty of experience with racism. Um, and I would ultimately just need him to weigh in on that type of stuff. But I, I delivered him a draft, uh, the afternoon before the eulogy around five 30, um, and told him right up front. I was like, listen, I don't think this is quite there. Uh, but it's, we're running out of time and it's, it's, I got to get you something. Um, and he said, all right, no problem. I'll take a look at it tonight and I'll get you edits in the morning. It didn't wait that long. He called me back to the White House around 11 at night. Um, and he had, he'd, he'd fairly heavily edited the first two pages. The second two pages, he just drew one big line through each of them, which he had never done to me before. Um, and fortunately, by then, I'd been writing for him for eight years. So I, I, I wasn't, if that had happened several years earlier, I might have just like passed out on the spot or, or just walked out the door and never come back. Um, but I was eager to see what he'd done. And he had rewritten the back half. Um, you know, I'd had, I'd had three days. He rewrote it in three hours by hand. And for the first time, I apologized to him. I actually told him, look, I'm sorry that I let you down here. Um, and he said, mm -mm. He, he put his hand on my shoulder and said, listen, brother, we're collaborators. You know, like he always said, um, you gave me what I needed to work with here. You know, and as you read through it, you're going to see some of your stuff in my rewrite. And when you've been thinking about race for 40 years, you'll know what you wanted to say too. 
And what a what a great mark of a boss. He he could have, you know, just told me I screwed up. Get out of here. You know, you suck. I'll find somebody else who can do this. Uh, even worse, he could have excised me from the equation and just given his edits back to somebody else to deliver to me, which which would be even worse. Instead, he bucked me up. He walked me through his edits. He told me, you know, uh, I got him what he needed. Just that that goes a long way. I'm sure he would have preferred a draft you to do less work on. But the fact that he could pour himself so thoroughly into it was what made that speech sing. Um, and it, it made the fact that I had to see him again six hours later all that much easier. What changes did he make? I mean, you've had that moment, the moment where, you know, he's crossed out half of what you've just spent 48 hours and very little sleep trying to put together, trying to walk that tightrope on. What did he change? The way we approached eulogies, especially ones that we knew the entire country would be watching, and in this case, we knew a lot of the world would be watching it too. Um, you know, the first, the first half or so is straightforward memorializing the victims. Um, you know, to, I, I've never viewed a eulogy as something that has to be sad. I think the rare exception to that was um, Newtown. You know, in 48 hours, we had to eulogize 20 little children. How do you do that? That's impossible. Um, but, but the reverend that we were there, you know, he was there on behalf of all nine people who were murdered, but, but it was the reverend's memorial service. His life wasn't sad. You know, this was a man who was both a reverend and a state representative who just spent all day, every day of his life tending to his flock, whether it was in the church or out in the broader community. Um, and he was a young man who had limitless promise and was just good. And his life wasn't sad. So writing about his life shouldn't be either. Um, we'd always viewed the second half of a eulogy as, especially for the president of the United States, as a sermon, more of, more of, guidance for the rest of us. What are our obligations and responsibilities now that this person is gone? What are we called to do in their wake? And <clears throat> I had kind of taken a half swing with it again. You know, it was, there was some beautiful language in there, but it was kind of safe. Um, not, not sterile, but, but, but safe. And that, that just wasn't enough to meet the moment. So what he did was he, the last words of mine that existed in that draft were amazing grace. And then he added the lyrics and he actually built the structure of the back half of the speech around the lyrics to Amazing Grace that, that we've been, you know, blind to race, racism. We've been blind to the unique mayhem that guns um, cause our communities. We've been blind to the pain the Confederates flag stirs in our citizens. Maybe we see that now. Now, none of that's literally true. We, we knew all too well what guns did. We knew all too well about racism and the Confederate flag. But it's back to that redemptive kind of politics where... If he had gone down there and just lectured people and said, you know, this is so-and-so's fault, so-and-so made this happen, you're not actually going to change any minds. But what if you could take advantage of this moment uh, of, of abject horror and national shame to convince people, all right, maybe we, maybe we can be better. Maybe we can walk in another direction. Maybe we can do what these families did and step outside of our comfort zones and, and you know, uh, pass some sensible gun legislation, bring down the Confederate flag, trade each other a little bit better, you know, just, just maybe recognize what other people have to go through. Um, and again, a speech won't solve everything, but it was just this, it was this beautifully simple structure that I was very frustrated with myself for not seeing. I want to just talk to that structure piece, the, the process piece of it, because I think for people who <clears throat> don't have to write speeches, where that, you know, writing presentations or speeches or statements is not a, it's not a natural part of their life or their career. It's easy to believe that it's just this moment of inspiration, right? Like you just start writing and it flows out of you like, like poetry almost. And there's this moment in the book where you're frozen, you know, you've, you've got a semi blank page, you know, you've got to hand it over in a matter of kind of days. And you said that, um, I reminded myself that I knew how to do this. There was a structure to follow. And we, can you just talk a little bit about that structure? What, what is the structure that you follow? How do you start? Yeah, they're, they're different for every kind of speech. But for this one, it was kind of the same as what I was saying earlier about a eulogy. You, you, you start with, you begin a eulogy by, by speaking literally to the front row. You know, the people who've lost the most, the people who had this person taken from them. And then you speak to the, the rows behind, you know, the, the broader community, his, his, his constituents, his parishioners. Um, and only then, and, and this is mostly only true for someone like a president, do you speak to 
that battery of unblinking lenses in the back of the church. He speaks to the wider world. So it's kind of like concentric rings. And then you spend some time, you know, if part of a eulogy, it, it shouldn't be a Wikipedia entry about a person's life. You don't just say, and then this happened, and then this happened. Tell one or two great stories, but make sure they both uh, lend themselves to the same broader lesson. What are you pulling out of that person's life? That should be a lesson for the rest of us. Um, then that's where you kind of go big into the rest of the sermon. You know, that, that's what it's about then. And uh, I knew all that. And, it's to, and, and again, the first part of the eulogy survived his edits. It was that second part um, that I just didn't have down. I love that idea of concentric circles of, you know, you start with the immediate, you move out, you move out, you move out as a, as a structure for how to put something together, how to put a speech or an idea together. Um, where's that line? That was another thing I was thinking a lot about when I was reading your book, the line between calling for action and inciting action. And, you know, we've seen the difference in that between two presidencies how do you walk that line? Because on the one hand, you want people to take action. And on the other hand, you need to be very measured with the action that you that you ask for or that you hint towards. How do you walk that line? Well, <clears throat> you know, we, we did spend a lot of our presidency calling for action, nurturing action, um, because there was a lot we wanted to change. And that's always much more difficult to to convince people to think beyond themselves to embrace the unknown you know everyone will say um we need to fix the healthcare system and then you try to do it and everyone will say i don't know man that sounds a lot different than what we have right now it's a devil you know thing um the, our successor donald trump as you said incited um and that's much easier to stoke people's basest instincts to kind of you know, flip over a rock and see what crawls out. You know, that's how you had in the first year of his administration, you had people marching uh, in, in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, yelling about, yelling about how, how, how their quote, Jews will not replace us. And this is, we've seen this before, but now they're marching with their hoods off. And that's a new thing. Um, you saw a whole spate of mass shootings in 2018 that were aimed at the Jewish community, that were aimed at women in a yoga studio, that were aimed at, um, African Americans. People ask me to this day, do a president's words still matter? Yeah. You just have to look at Donald Trump as evidence. You know, he, he didn't, I don't think this country got any more uh, racist or misogynist or anything once he took office. He just gave people permission to be that way in public. And it's a lot easier to destroy than it is to build. Um, so I don't walk that line really i i much prefer um the path that we walked even though it's much more difficult you know it's always it's always uh harder to build than it is to destroy but you know this this there's a reason that the subtitle of the book is is the battle for america you know it, it comes I, I took it from obama's thesis in the selma speech which is that politics isn't a clash of armies it's a clash of wills it's a contest to determine the true meaning of America. And we are always engaged in this battle, whether we like it or not. Uh, you know, if you don't show up at the polls, somebody else is going to. And it's it's the side in the clash of wills that, that works harder and longer and never gives up that's ultimately going to determine what this country looks like and what it believes in. So, so I'm just thinking there, listen to you, the, the difference between fear and hope. You know, to come from a place of hope. Or to come from a place of here is a list of all the things you have to be afraid of right now. You know, one incites, one calls for action and a coming together. The other one incites a fear-based response, which is human beings is never usually the healthiest of responses. Um, go forward to day 10. I'm going to go forward to day 10. So by this time, by this time, um, the Supreme Court has ruled um, four on Obamacare, um, also in favor of marriage equality. So you have these two huge wins that have that have happened by this stage. You finishing up the kind of the final drafts of the Charleston eulogy, and you're on Air Force One, and you're 
you're talking to Obama and he says something which really took me by surprise, even though I knew the outcome here, really took me by surprise. And he mentions the possibility that he might do something as part of that eulogy. Just speak to that moment. Yeah, sure. He, he flat out said, if it feels right, I might sing it. And that hadn't occurred to me either. You know, I was already kicking myself over not seeing the structure for the back half of the speech. And now I was kicking myself over not seeing the fact that he might sing it. And that comes from... Um, his experience with the black church, with the AME church, haven't spent a lot of time in those pews. I mean, he knew how it would be received in ways that I wouldn't have thought of. Um, you know, that's why it's so important to have, whether whether it's on your speechwriting team or any organization, to have all sorts of different lenses there. Because um, that's just an idea that I don't know how many days I would have had uh, afterwards that I still wouldn't have thought that up. I could have had an extra three days to write the speech and I wouldn't have thought, up, thought that up. Um, and but I forgot to tell everybody else back at the White House that he said he was going to sing. So it was a surprise to everybody else. You know, I knew it was coming. Um, there were only about five of us who knew that it was coming. But but part of me is glad I didn't spoil that surprise so that, that everybody could enjoy that together. And you just had this beautiful way of responding, this, a beautiful response to that Um said, Obama stood up, ducking under the ceiling as he buttoned his coat. You know, if it feels right, I might sing. He's bone tired. All I could come up with was a phrase he had recently told me that Sasha was fond of. You do you, man. You do you, man. You do you. Which, again, just pausing there to take a breath, there's a fearlessness in that from both of you. You know, there's a fearlessness from him to take it that one step further. You know, you think that through as as any human being, you know, you start singing all the ways that that could go wrong. You know, you could end up very much alone in that moment. And a fearlessness from you as well to not to not caution, to not um, come up with all the reasons why that might not work, to just say you do you, man. Had you, was it just tiredness at that moment or was it earned fearlessness? Um, <clears throat> a mix of both, but, but it, a lot of it was... Uh, So much of our jobs as communications people in the White House were weighing risk and finding reasons that he shouldn't do something and shouldn't say something. Uh, And we were always at our best when we considered that risk and threw it out and just went for it. And we knew that. Um, But that day, too, you know, and and he'd added this to this. He added this to the speech that morning uh, that he felt he had he had an open heart after the way the, the country had conducted itself in the days since the shooting, um, beginning with those families and continuing through the Confederate flag coming down and, and over a lot of spaces, not all, um, and America's biggest retailers saying, even though it shouldn't have taken that long, saying that they're going to stop selling Confederate flag merchandise. And, and then, uh, you know, millions of Americans get to keep their health insurance. Millions of Americans finally get to get married based off this, this one courageous man's crusade to marry his dying husband. Um, you know, he, he really had an open heart and I was feeling it. We were all feeling it, it, it on, in different reasons. You know, for me, we had a bunch of gay colleagues in the white house and I had been all week long. I had been dreading having to look them in the eye if the Supreme court ruled the other way, you know, how do you, what do you say, um, to a colleague and a friend who has just been told by the highest court in the land that you don't get to get married? Um, now in DC, they would have been able to be, it was a state level thing, but, but still the point stands. Um, but I didn't have to do that. So, you know, I'm, I'm watching these jubilant scenes on television, like everybody else at the Supreme court and, and you go out into the Rose garden and it was, it was probably, it was probably the, the most packed crowd I'd ever seen at the white house and remarkably young. And you just see people hugging and, you know, two people proposed to their significant others that night on the white house lawn. It's just, how could you not have a, a, an open and full heart? So even though we were on our way to uh, memorial as someone who was murdered by a white supremacist because of the color of his skin, um, there was something there, uh, a sense of possibility. And uh, he decided to capitalize on that by, I write in the book too, as you, as you astutely noticed, that we did have a sense of fearlessness at that point that came with... Um, not just seven years in the White House, but nine years, including the campaign of, you know, we were still standing um, through it all. And so the, he did have this this kind of sense of liberated fearlessness where he was just going to go for it. And he knew that the audience would be there to catch him. So he did. And and they did. Tell me, tell me about that moment. You know, that's a full swing, right? 
we go back to that half swing versus full yeah. swing. Tell me, tell me about the moment when he started singing. Well, so I had I had a unique vantage point. I was watching on television like the rest of the world, but I was watching on Air Force One I in Charleston. I didn't get off the plane. Um, and that's because he was still editing up until basically he got to the arena. Uh, he took the last two pages with him in the limousine to keep working on him on the, on the car ride. And I decided it was just too risky to try to make edits on the fly. You know, this is 2015. We had wireless cards in our laptop, but there's a lot of people in an arena. What if the signal's not working and we're making people wait? You can't do that. So I stayed on the plane and his, uh, his assistant who was traveling with him phoned in the final edits. I made the edits and, and, and got it to the teleprompter. Um, but now I'm alone on the plane and I can kick back. And there's, there's kind of this amazing feeling when you're a speechwriter. You know, you've got all this, all this stress and angst for days as you're working on a speech. But as soon as you click send and it's out, ready for the wider world, you just kind of relax and nobody cares about you anymore. You know, you've gone from the most sought after person in the White House that morning to uh, Mr. Irrelevant. So I, I put my feet up uh, and, you know, the, one of the stewards on the plane came around and asked if I wanted a beer. And I said, yeah, I want a beer. So I just I sat there and watched it on TV. And when it gets to the point when he's about to sing, because, um, again, you know, most 99.99% of people watching this don't have the text. They have no idea where he's going, but I know where he is. Um, he pauses for 11 seconds. And my first thought is, oh, no, people watching are to think he's he's missing a page or something and trying to figure out what to say next. Um, but it turns out he was just collecting himself. You know, I asked him afterwards, I was like, what was with the pause, dramatic effect? And he said, no. The thing, you know, the thing about Amazing Grace is you got to start low. Otherwise, by the time you get to the words, a wretch like me, your voice cracks. So he was he was just getting ready to start real low. You know, the, the complexity of emotions for everybody during that time, everybody on your team, you know, you've... You said you've had two landmark wins. You've had a tragedy. You've had personally been grappling with goodness knows how many versions of goodness, how many speeches plus this huge eulogy. When you look back now, what's what's the overarching feeling of those ten days for you? You know, they're, they're, it still it still conjures up a lot of um, a lot of possibility. You know, and hope and optimism. It's it, the, one, a really important thing to remember about that week is it wasn't all just Barack Obama. It was the, the the families who influenced the way everybody acted. And even beyond that, it was, you know, marriage equality was the result of a 50-year movement for LGBTQ rights uh, in which a lot of people bled and a couple even died. Um, healthcare was the result. And again, I know this is insane to explain the people who have universal health coverage, but it was a result of a 100 year movement for universal health care in America. And we still haven't finished the job. Um, you know, we're still engaged in this 400 year, 400 plus year movement for civil rights uh, and equality in this country. Um, so it, it, it the, the, thinking back on those 10 days does give me a lot of pride in not just what, you know, our White House could accomplish. Um, but also in like what America can accomplish when we actually keep at it. Um, and even when it does feel like we're backsliding in a lot of ways right now, you know, part of writing this book was showing people a template for how to write the ship, how to, how to change the inertia um, and, uh, and, and get back to that sort of that place of grace. My final question, what's the, I mean, you teach speech writing now. Um, and anybody who's lucky enough to to go on that journey with you and to get to learn from you, what's the what's the biggest piece of advice that you find yourself? I know you've given your fair share of commencement speeches as well. That you find yourself coming back to time and time again. Uh, dive in, dive in. It, it's I, I tell my students to just go. They're always they're always so hesitant about you know they're they're nervous about what their first job is going to be that it might dictate the entire course of their career. You know, should I really get on a campaign? What if it loses? Um, you got to get rid of that fear and just dive in. Now, that's easy for me to say because I happen to be part of some, you know, once in a generation campaigns. But politics is something that is worthy of your time and effort. That's exactly what I tell my students. I actually just gave them their last lecture on Monday in which I said all that. Um, and they give me a lot of hope. You know, we, I, I take... I, I took classes in the same classroom where I teach now at Northwestern. Um, but it was a totally different time. 
You know, I was born in 1980, and, you, and coming of age in the 80s and 90s is, is completely different than coming of age in the aughts and the teens. You know, most of my students were born right around 9-11 and grew up knowing America at war and a financial crisis and a pandemic and climate change and, and active shooter drills in their classrooms. I mean, you know, the, the, when I let them choose a topic for their speeches, about half of them write about climate change and guns. Um, and that's not something I would have thought to write 20 years ago. You know, they've just come up in a different time. And so change for them uh, is existential. They're very impatient to get out there and get involved and get engaged and change the world. And so I, I tell them, uh, just do it. You know, I, I added a line to President Obama's farewell address uh, about running for office, a whole paragraph, actually, where I said, show up, dive in. Um, I have had one young woman sent me a photo. I don't know her, uh, a photo that she got that tattooed on her ankles, show up and dive in. And a state legislator in Connecticut, uh, 26 years old, reached out to me, said, you know, I, I, I was just out of college. I didn't know what to do with my life. And then I saw President Obama say, grab a clipboard and get some signatures, lace up your shoes, run for office. And he did. And he's been a state representative uh, for six years now. You know, it's just, it is wild to see when a speech actually works. Um, it's always fun, you know, so, so let your, let your speech writers know when a speech works. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's impossible to imagine, right? Nearly a decade, over a decade of, of speeches, the ripple effects of the words and the telling of those words have had on the world at large and, and to specific human beings within that world. Cody, it's been a pleasure as always, and it's been amazing to have you back. Thank you. And thank you for writing the book. Thank you very much, Julie. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode and have seized hold of at least one tool, idea or mindset that will help you start raising your own level of influence. Now, for those of you who want to take the next step in your journey or would just love a roadmap to becoming the most influential voice, idea or brand in your space, then I have good news. You can now download the latest updated version of my ebook, The Influencer Code, from my website, juliemasters.com. Also, there's a link in the show notes. Just pop in your email address, and I promise I will not spam you, but it is jam packed full of ideas, tools, and case studies that I have come across in my now 20 plus years of doing this work. Not to mention the seven areas and seven core questions that I have found to be hands down the most valuable when it comes to immediately lifting your ability to make an impact. Download it, keep it, share it, juice it for all it is worth. I hope it makes a massive difference in both your career and your business. Thank you always to my co-founder and the main brain behind this podcast, Lauren Kelly. You kick my butt in all the right ways. Thank you for making it happen. And if you did enjoy the show, then we would love you to share this podcast and leave us a review on iTunes, Google, Stitcher, whatever your platform of choice happens to be. And don't forget to subscribe to make sure that you never miss an episode.